good to have you here today. Uh, really a special edition, I think, of PHM Presents. My name is Ken Levinson, the Executive Director of the Passive House Network. And today we'll be talking about how Massachusetts has mandated Passive House certification in the new opt-in stretch code, uh, what that means, how they've done it, uh, why they've done it, and the implications of it. I'm really happy to have Paul Ormond here from uh, DOER. Um, but before we get to it and dive into that, I want to say a couple of words about the Passive House Network, unless uh, if you're if you're not familiar with us. So we are a national nonprofit, 501c3, uh, with membership and chapters, various regional chapters around the country. We also work in collaboration with various passive house and energy efficiency uh, organizations. I will be at the Nessie conference on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week. So hope to see you there if you're in the area. Um, we're affiliated with the Passive House Institute in Darmstadt, Germany, an affiliate of the International Passive House Association um, and work with the North American Certifier Circle, which is a group of over 30 individual certifiers um, and 14 or 15 distinct organizations, independent organizations, uh, working to certify buildings to the international Passive House standards. Um, we're really about collecting global uh, knowledge, capacity, networks, applying it to regional contexts and applications. So we hope you'll get involved and, and join us going forward. We're really focused on education, training, and capacity building. A quick note here on upcoming trainings, we actually have a certified Passive House designer training uh, organized um, geographically for the Northeast and New England in particular, kicking off next Friday on March 31st. So if you've been thinking about getting certified as a Passive House designer, as architect, consultant, engineer, so forth, now's a great time. And Mass Save has 50% discount available to Massachusetts residents and Connecticut is doing one better. I believe it's at 75% discount at this point um, for folks who pass the exam. So definitely check that out. Other events that we have coming up include next week, next Thursday, the PH Ribbon case studies we're kicking off looking at a single family home in California featuring Bronwyn Barry and Steve Mann and looking at embodied carbon. And the PH ribbon is an embodied carbon calculator that is incorporated into the PHPP energy model. Um, and so it allows you to actually calculate whole building carbon emissions over the lifetime of the building embodied and operational, which of course is coming from the energy models of the PHPP. We're getting more and more questions about certification as uh, it becomes more prevalent, and we have a series called Ask the Passive House Certifiers. As we mentioned, there's many independent certifiers. Lois Arena from Stephen Winter Associates is one of those certifiers, and she'll be joining us on April 6th to take your questions about multifamily, uh, in particular focus, um, uh, and certification to the International Passive House Standards again. Save the date. We have a conference coming up in the fall in Denver. Colorado. It will be a hybrid conference. You can join online or in person. We're definitely uh, looking forward to getting together in person and hope you can make it. There will be workshops and great building tours happening out there. There's a lot happening uh, out on the front range there in Colorado uh, with the Marshall Fire Rebuild, uh, moving the utilities. XL Energy is doing a lot in support of, of Passive House and as well as the city of Denver and the state of Colorado. So Hopefully they'll be giving Massachusetts a run for their money soon. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I just want to mention, you know, the uh, uh, the a recent presentation that I actually gave to uh, the Mass Save Lunch and Learn with Pass Fast Massachusetts on the path of certification for multifamily projects. And that presentation just walks you through step by step, kind of demystifying a bunch of the issues around passive house certification to the international standards and um and it's available on our website all of these are obviously on our website um easy enough to find there that's under building certification so without further ado i'm very pleased to introduce paul ormond 
engineer at Massachusetts DOER. So it's the Department of Energy Resources, um, which is the energy office for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Paul works on uh, the Commonwealth's efforts to improve building codes and energy policy, particularly as they relate to decarbonization of the built environment. Paul is also the course developer and instructor for the Decarbonizing the Building Sector course at Harvard University Extension School. Paul is a licensed Massachusetts professional engineer and a graduate of Worcester Polytechnic Institute and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, I ask everybody as we transition here, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We'll have a discussion after and we'll be pulling your questions from the chat into, uh, into my discussion with Paul. So I'm very pleased to welcome Paul and, and hear about this amazing um, momentous occasion of transition of how we're thinking about building performance. There's a lot to dig in here. Yes, great. Thank you. Can can you hear me? Okay, everyone. Yep. Yep. You're good. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the last admit all. Um, yep, I've got it now. I'll, I'll let you take it from there. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Um, let me uh, let me share my screen. It's really nice to see you all uh, on Zoom. Uh, I see. I always as I was checking people in, I see a lot of old friends and lots of new friends here. So hello to all. Um, hold on one second. Let's see if I can share this successfully. And uh, there we go. Is that, uh, does that look okay, Ken? Full of screen? Okay, thumbs up. Okay. Um, Thanks so much for the introduction. I really appreciate it. Thanks for allowing us to be here, a chance to get the word out on what we're doing here in Massachusetts. Just as additional background on the Department of Energy Resources in Massachusetts, um, all this is um, in, in Massachusetts, uh, I won't go through the details, but we're, we, we have a law that we passed that our state will be decarbonized to a certain level um, by certain milestone dates out into the future. Um, so it's really exciting because when the leadership of the state can pass a law like that, you know, based on what the citizens demand, that, you know, a lot of really great things can start happening. So um, when I first joined the Department of Energy Resources, we were just getting started with building decarbonization in earnest. And it's just been an awesome, amazing eight years um, with almost perfect timing with the emergence of Passive House as a, uh, a really awesome go-to efficiency standard, as well as the emergence of cold climate air source heat pumps has kind of came together uh, in perfect harmony to, uh, to allow us to decarbonize our building sector in a way that I don't think anyone would have thought possible, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So it's really exciting. Um, so with that, um, the, uh, uh, the state of Massachusetts uh, will have a new code that will go into effect on 1 July um, this summer. And uh, it has a number of really exciting new um, elements to it. Um, so it does have a component to it that makes mand Passive House mandatory uh, in certain circumstances. So we can talk about the specifics of that. But the other thing is too, the code in general, like it basically broadly um, requires, even where a passive house specifically isn't required, the code itself broadly requires um, elements of passive house um, in a significant way. So we'll talk about that mostly here too. Um, so even if it, even if passive house itself isn't required uh, following the standard code, um, you'll be doing a lot of passive house like things along the way. Um, so what, when we begin our journey to re upgrade our code, um, this began about three years ago. <laughs> we our starting point was this, which was aside from energy efficiency, just improving um, the the overall uh, utility reduction of our buildings. What other things do we want our buildings to accomplish? And we came up with these four things, you know, comfort, resilience. Um, we, we wanted buildings to have simplified and reduced HVAC wherever possible. Um, but the, the, the number one most important thing is 
how can we get our buildings to be electric ready uh, so we can start to not use fossil fuels anymore in our building sector? Um, so those were the four key goals. And um, for those that are familiar with uh, LEED or familiar with Massachusetts stretch code, um, what we, you know, any, any, any code that is um, uh, trying to use an above code type of program, where this could be your utility programs, mass save, things of that nature. Sure. The traditional way to measure building, measure success in building performance has been looking at energy use intensity, the EUI of a building, and, you know, looking at, you know, where, where would you need to be? That's the code. And then, you know, how much better can we be than that? And that's the improved. And it would be typical that you run an energy model, you know, the before and after, and you take a look at the percent improvement of that. Um, and uh, Massachusetts has had a stretch code in place for about 10 years that allows cities and towns to opt in to a higher level of performance. And that higher level performance was using this kind of approach. It said that um, if you wanna be part of the stretch code, uh, you can do so in, in the way that you then show compliance is that your building has to be, you know, 10, 15, 20% better than it otherwise would normally be under the regular code um, on an EUI site energy basis. And when we when we examined um, the the code that we that we wanted to prepare this this go around of code improvements, um, you know, we I was very fortunate to work with a team here that took a more holistic approach and, um, you know, looking at those four, what do we want buildings to achieve questions, you know, ask ourselves is improving, you know, is, 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 is just making a percent improvement of an EUI. Is that really the best way to do a code? Um, if your if your desired outcome are those four things and, uh, and maybe that's kind of out of date. Um, so, so that was kind of the, the question we asked ourselves. Um, so just to give an idea of the process we went through, just a very, very thin sliver of it. Um, we took a look at, for example, an office building like this, and we took a look, um, if someone were to, if, if someone was given the mission of, okay, what few things would you do to this office buildings that would result in specifically uh, easier electrification, better comfort, resilience, um, reducing gas use, things of that nature. If you, what specific things would you do to a building to to achieve those kind of outcomes? You know what what the building scientist would tell you is, oh, okay. In that case, you know, instead of focusing on reducing lighting and you know improving the pump efficiencies and stuff, what we would do is we would improve the envelope. We'd reduce the ventilation. We'd have more ventilation under recovery. There'd be those specific kinds of improvements. So if you then run the models and you take a look at your EUI improvement, if you were to use this kind of focused um, envelope and energy recovery strategy, your EUI improvement would be pretty modest looking um, for that office building, for example. You'd only have a 6% improvement. So when you when you see a result like that, you 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 realize like uh, EUI better than better than EUI kind of thing. Maybe that's not the best approach because if we simply just continue down the path of a stretch code where you know we just have this EUI percent improvement thing, we're gonna miss you know all of these maybe opportunities because if a building design team um, were to you know, if a building owner was interested in these kind of things and they asked their building design team to make a more efficient building, if this was the only metric he was presented um, and they had, you know, the, the building team was proposing to improve envelope and energy recovery, then it would look like envelope and energy recovery don't do much. And, you know, th this is so, so it's, we're, we're, you know, you start to realize real quickly that not only is EUI not helpful, so it's not helping you. It's actually hurting you, because if you if you improve the envelope and energy recovery of a building, um, the 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 benefits are huge, huge. 
So if this is just the same EUI plot, except the only thing I've done now is instead of looking at percent improvement of that overall, um, showing now the, the red bar part is the heating load. And, you know, it doesn't look like much because it's uh, such a big scale there. Um, you see that red at the bottom, there's a heating load there. It doesn't look like much. And then the improved building is this uh, lower heating load. Again, doesn't look like much because the scale is so big. So EUI is kind of a kind of a bad indicator for these things and possibly counterproductive because if we blow it up, what did we do? We reduced the heating load by 90%. And um, so, you know, that... So, the, so as just kind of a, as a as a marketing tool, would, is 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 it? You know, I can, I can propose envelope and energy recovery, and do I say that I have a seven percent reduction in EUI, or do I say I have a ninety percent reduction in space heating? Well, clearly, the ninety percent reduction in space heating is going to grab attention, right? That's going to show clearly we're making progress. And if we if we go back to the mission, what do we want buildings to? to do for us, comfort, resilience, making electrification easy, et cetera, et cetera, 90% reduction in space heating is gonna hit it out of the park. Um, so let's just take a look. This is the same exact building example. Um, if I have that building and we run a theoretical model here where um, we look at the, the worst weather week here in Boston in the last 25 years, where it was sustained negative seven degrees, for a uh, number of hours for, you know, over this one worst week we've ever experienced. And we take a look at that code building. That, that code building, by the way, is built to our current stretch code, which is supposed to be super great. Um, that current stretch code building is the gray uh, line there. And that's showing the interior temperatures of this building during that worst week if the heat was just completely turned off because of a power outage. And what you find in that building is the interior temperatures get to be in the high 30s very quickly. And that obviously would set all sorts of alarms off, you know, for risk of freezing. Um, not to mention that just be, you don't, wouldn't ever want to work in such a building. That's, that would have to be almost um, vacated. Um, now, the same building, the one that's supposedly only 7% or 6% better EUI, um, that building that that focuses on energy recovery and uh, and and uh, building envelope, um, that's the blue line. And what was the performance of that building? You can see it never got below fifty three degrees, with no heat on in that building for seven days during the worst week of the twenty five years. Um, so clearly, um, having a ninety percent reduction in space heating and that happened because we reduced our heating loads. The heating needs are just less. That means if we lose power, that means that our building sustains uh, on the inside, no problem. So we can ride out the storm. So this is an indication not just of resilience, but of comfort, right? So this is, a, this is a way more comfortable building. We can sit next to the windows and be comfortable. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's what we want buildings to achieve. So that's, that's what we would be missing if we just judged based on EUI reduction. Um, Another dynamic that we found, uh, we priced everything through this construction company here in, um, in New England, Consigli Construction. They've, they're one of the biggest um, construction companies in New England, done you know, literally hundreds of millions of square feet of, of commercial construction. Um, when they priced out that better building, you know, better envelope, better energy recovery, um, and um, what obviously we're spending more money on the envelope. So there's there's a there's a premium you pay. Um, but before we gave them that the thing to price, we we had the engineers, in this case Stephen Winters and Bureau Happold and, and BR Plus A um, here in the Boston area. Um, we, we asked them, you know, if you have an envelope you can count on, um, can we reduce the HVAC systems? And once you can count on that envelope, which maybe in the past you've never really been able to do, or you maybe wouldn't want to do, uh, but if you can have an envelope you can count on, do you need perimeter heating? You know, can you do you can you have less distribution of of heating all around in your spaces in these large office buildings? Well, if, if you if you can reduce that that stuff, that's millions and millions of dollars saved. So once BR Plus A and Stephen Winters and Bureau Happold you know, ran those numbers and, you know, conservatively, we're able to find some nice economies there of the HVAC systems. 
that means that the HVAC system costs went down. So it's really, when you look at what does it cost to do these kind of improvements, this is the net of these things that matters, right? Um, so if you took at that, take a look at that net cost, we looked at small office, large office, and these different building types. We did find that um, for most building types, the net cost does go up. It just doesn't go up as much as you'd think, because again, you're getting a net against some HVAC savings. Sometimes that savings was big, sometimes it was modest, depends on building scale and size and things. That's why this varies so much. Um, so we, we do have to pay a small price in the first cost. That can be a few percent. This, generally, the smaller the building is, the larger that, that price goes up, that first cost. Um, one, one type of building here, large office, you actually see the net cost went down. Kind of, kind of blows your mind, right? So we can, we can and if, the, if the office building gets very, very large, you find that you can, the, the cost of HVAC reduction is larger than the savings you get with HVAC reduction is larger than what you put into a better envelope and energy recovery. So the, the price goes down for a better building, not bad. Um, that doesn't usually happen just for that one building type in certain circumstances. Now, we also took a look at life cycle costs of all these situations. The life cycle cost is always better. Um, so you're paying a premium, sure, but over 25 years, et cetera, you're, you're paying a lot less over time. And that's from an energy policy standpoint, our mission, you know, by legislation is to uh, develop codes and the, the criteria for a code improvement is always based on does it improve the life cycle cost. Uh, so we found that for all building types, the code does do that. Now, one thing this doesn't show is there's really great incentives here in Massachusetts. We have uh, incentives for commercial buildings that are, you know, they're in the six figures and sometimes seven figures, um, depending on how building, how big your building is from paid for by the utilities for being more efficient. Passive house uh, multifamily here in Massachusetts gets a $3,000 per unit incentive. Um, when you start counting those kind of things in this model, that first cost is reduced between 0.5 and 2%. Um, so imagine post incentives, those first costs go down by between 0.5 and 2%. So it starts to approach um, cost neutral <laughs> with when you count incentives. It's not always cost neutral, but certainly it doesn't cost you know an arm and a leg for a much better building. Um, all right, so let's see what all the guy next going on. This is this is really the most important reason from our perspective for doing these better building, for going in this direction. And that is um, get back to our state has a law that says that we have to have a certain level of, of decarbonization across our whole economy, including buildings um, by, by 2050, by 2030, et cetera. And uh, we keep getting sued because we're not making enough progress. Um, so, so what are we doing to solve that? What's happening here in Massachusetts and is happening all over the country, all over the world, um, is we're building huge amounts of utility scale, wind, solar, and hydro. Um, and so those, those inputs are now replacing um, the, the fossil fuels that were used for electric power production. So that means that the emissions of the electric grid um, is going down every year because the way we're making electric power is less and less fossil fuels each year and is more and more emissions free inputs. Um, so in the year 2023 today, uh, if I swap from 95% efficient natural gas boiler space heating, um, the amount of emissions to do that to make one MMBTU, to deliver one MMBTU heat to a space is 120 pounds. Um, if I do the same thing with an electric heat pump air source in Massachusetts, that has 53% lower emissions. Um, and what's great, we build our buildings today, put air source heat pumps in, that building 30 years from now, in the year 2050, as more and more um, on uh, uh, production scale renewables go onto our grid, the emissions of that electric power is going to go down each year. So by 2050, the emissions to provide that MMB2 of space is now 93% smaller than the gas. Um, so, and, and, and by the way, um, 
not official state policy here yet. Hopefully it will be soon. The emissions rates of gas of 116 pounds per mmbtu. That doesn't take into effect fugitive emissions. And I hope someday it does, because I think once we count those effects, that emissions rates of gas actually is going to be much higher than the than than what the DOE says it is now. So hopefully that day will come. But um, even with the uh, with with uh, potentially a, a wildly uh, underestimated gas emissions rate, you can see that um, going with electrification just simply beats the pants off even the best fossil fuels with the best condensing boilers. It's not even close, um, especially by 2050. Um, so this is taking a look at um, a office building that is um, in the year 2050. Um, if I build that office building today with gas, <laughs> space heating and space water, um, in the year 2050, the emissions footprint of that building is the left bar graph. It's 600 tons per year. Um, if I build that, 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 this is for all energy use, including lighting and everything. This is 100% of its energy use. What is the carbon footprint of that building in the year 2050? In um, in in the year 2050, if I if I were to use um, the better code with that reduced space heating um, and swapping that space heating from gas to electric with our better emissions inputs, that would have a 30% lower emissions rate. You can see most of the a good chunk of the um, the carbon footprint of that building in the year 2050 is is just simply related to space heating which is kind of boggles the mind because the energy use of a um, of an office building um, I showed you in an earlier plot the 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 contribution of space heating in an office building on a on an on a BTU basis is actually very small an office building on a BTU basis has most is mostly from lighting but on, on an emissions basis by 2050 the uh, just the space heating is going to be a huge amount of its carbon footprint. So it, it really shows you that um, putting gas in today is locking in uh, legacy problems uh, in a significant way. Um, now, this this is this problem is just off the charts. Um, uh, even more so, everything I just said when you look at multifamily because there's so much larger contribution of space heating. Um, this is the same concept, but now for a multifamily house, 70% smaller reduction. So if, if we continue to build multifamily with gas today, uh, by 2050, almost the entire carbon footprint of those multifamilies will be simply due to space heating. Again, it sort of boggles the mind that, that we're not you know, 100% off space heating already with gas um, based on, on this kind of future. Um, so now we can't just take our current code, which has a lot of space heating still, um, and then swap from gas to electric. If we do that, every utility will tell you, and, and they're all freaking out right now that as we go from gas to electric, um, we're going to break our grid because suddenly there's going to be all this new peak load in the winter of electric use. And uh, the good news is that if we reduce our space heating by a factor of 10, by modest improvements and strategic improvements to envelope and energy recovery, um, and then we switch from electric to gas, the peak load in some cases actually goes down. In buildings, so if it doesn't go down, it, it stays the same or it goes up by only a small amount. So this was the other reason that we were able to get our stretch code through all the political hurdles, because at the end of the day, when we build with our new stretch code, it allows us to electrify our buildings, get off gas without impacting the grid. Okay, if we, we we simply can't achieve this with our current stretch code. And when we looked at the impacts across the whole economy, if we looked at, you know, if we built all building, all new buildings um, with electric instead of gas, uh, moving forward, starting today, um, for all buildings that we expect to build um, in the next, you know, 30 years, what's the impact of the grid? It's 5%. 
the 5% increase to the peak heating load when you apply this across the entire state by 2050 for all new construction. Um, so that's, that is an incredibly huge achievement um, to swap to all electric with almost no impact to our overall grid. Buildings account for half of our state emissions. So the, the other half is all industry and all transportation. So it, it is a huge achievement to achieve this. This is all made possible because of Passive House. We simply would be, we would be having to otherwise spend just untold billions of dollars improving our grid if it wasn't for Passive House and those concepts. Okay, so, so clearly looking at um, a, a mandate of achieving, reducing space heating is um, clearly, a better way to examine performance of buildings because we know that we can get that number to be so much smaller. Um, EUI is almost noise. Um, when we look at reducing space heating by 90% or 60% and whatever different building types, we're getting much better comfort resilience, better simplified HVAC, but most importantly, we're making everything electric ready without breaking our grid. Um, all right. so. Everyone always wants to know about cooling. And, and this is this, so this is two really big rebuttals I always get from the industry, which is uh, oh my God, every time I improve my envelope, my cooling goes up. And and that happens. And the reason that happens is because our envelopes now aren't that great. So, you know, if I make our envelope great, then it actually retains a lot of heat. You know, this this is very true for office buildings and schools and things where maybe this isn't so true for um, for residential or especially single family residential, but in multifamily residential and, and office buildings, this happens. And uh, my my response to that is, so what? As long as you don't make the um, the the space cooling, you know, unreasonably bigger. Um, it's okay to have a space cooling that either stays the same or gets a little bit bigger because the benefits of that reduction in space heating are just um, off the charts. They're, they're, it, be, we, we're, that allows us to go to our decarbonized future without breaking our grid. Like, so though we're getting all these benefits and the price we're paying is potentially in, increasing the, the space cooling by 10%. So it's just a non-issue. So it's very typical that in a building, as uh, we make progress on envelope um, and energy recovery, our space cooling can go up, but it's nothing to be afraid of. And what do we do about it? What Passive House has been doing about this for decades, right? Th this is kind of an, this this isn't necessarily part of the regular mindset of the non-Passive House world that we're going to increase the uh, the the performance of the building and heating with better envelope energy recovery. But what do we also have to do in tandem? We're going to make be very careful about external shading. We're going to apply recessed windows, lower heat gain so efficient, uh, heat solar heat gain coefficients, um, and we're going to be thoughtful about aperture so we don't have unnecessary um, solar gains. Um, not necessarily part of the regular design process for for um, for passive for non-passive house kind of community. But if we apply these things, this is going to be what addresses um, what, what, what could otherwise be a large increase in, in space cooling. So it can be managed, right? So if you look at typical buildings with good strategies like this, we can, we can crush the space heating to oblivion and manage the space cooling. And that's going to be a success when we do those things. Um, now, in our actual code, um, we don't... Um, it's getting you know one level of building science and nerdiness here. Um, we don't actually uh, regulate the space heating part of the EUI. We regulate the the demand on the demand side of the equation. Uh, just a more direct measure of space heating and space cooling than EUI is. Um, takes out the effect of of efficiency. So it's a very direct measure. And if th this is exactly what Passive House has been doing for how many decades now? Uh, so this is now so 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 again our code mandates passive house in certain in certain circumstances, but it also requires this stuff 
for basically all buildings. So, so yes, we have a passive house mandate for some buildings, but all the rest of the buildings have a passive house type of mandate too, um, through this process that we now have in our new code of regulating heating and cooling thermal energy demand intensities. Um, so one of the most common questions I've got the last few months about this is, why do we have to have Teddy, right? Why can't you just say what you want for your envelope um, performance and for your window performance and energy recovery? Um, why do I have to do a model and just, you know, just tell me what you want for those values? And, and the answer is because, um, you know, we think it's valuable to have designers and architects um, have an opportunity to take advantage of solar gains advantageously, minimize solar gains in the sun with external shading, thoughtful building formats, thoughtful apertures. Um, we can achieve all these things, crush the heating, manage the cooling, okay? You wouldn't be able to do that thoughtful architecture approach and use those strategies to achieve your heating cooling teddies with just a simple, you know, mandate of envelope and um, energy recovery. Um, so I think that's really important for, for us to, to build into our code. So our code uh, has this Teddy performance as a performance approach so that we can unlock some of these cool architecture um, um, tools so we can make best, you know, so we can so we can achieve those performance things by being smart about our um, about some of these things. Um, so that's that's number one. Um, so in general, you'll see our code has uh, not just not just for the passive house subset, but for all buildings, way higher quality envelope information, air leakage testing, ventilation and recovery, and also thermal bridge mitigation. Um, so these are the uh, the Teddy limits um, that are in our code. What's different about the way our code is approaching the the thermal heating cooling thermal demand uh, um, that from way passive houses so in our code if you follow the passive house pathway then you then you just follow the, that pathway and you you would you would use your normal woofy models etc to show compliance and you're done if you're not following a passive house pathway in our code you would use the normal building models that people are used to using here in Massachusetts and elsewhere um, for stretch code compliance, which is EQuest, Energy Plus, and IES, and you would achieve these limits. So it's just a different prop that's using tools that people are accustomed to. Um, okay, so I'm going to end here in just a moment. Um, I just wanted to uh, maybe end with um, where stretch, where the, where the, um, the passive house mandate fits into the scheme of things. So you have a picture of that. So here in Massachusetts, we have three levels of codes. There's base code, which is just kind of straight up IECC 2021 with, with uh, just a couple of very minor changes. Um, and uh, that's the starting point for code. Everyone has to comply with that. Then we have the stretch code. So cities and towns can elect to be in the stretch code. Um, and the stretch code that will start in July 1, 20, this, this coming summer, is also based on IECC 2021, but includes all the teddies and all those other improvements that we've been discussing to achieve those, those buildings with crushed space heating and managed space cooling. Um, there's another level of performance that cities and towns can sign up for. And, that's the, and this is a new level, which is the specialized code. And with the specialized code, you get everything that's in the stretch code, except that specialized code mandates passive house for, um, for multifamily. And it, um, it also mandates electrification to some extent and solar PV to some extent. We can talk about those details if you like. Um, what's great in Massachusetts is almost every city and town is already on the stretch code. So the base code is almost irrelevant the, those those towns that have not signed up for stretch code aren't usually where there's a lot of buildings. Um, so all the major towns that sort of matter are have been on stretch code for many years. We already have um, 
several towns that have opted in to the specialized. So that's the, those towns with the, the dark blue there. Um, that's where there'll be mandatory passive house coming. Um, and then I heard just today, city of Boston, going to be on the stretch on the uh, on the opt-in uh, that's now going to go in front of their um, their city council so uh, let me stop there um, and I have a bunch more slides that detail more about the code but we thought we would be good to turn into a discussion at this point wow Paul you saved the headline for the last oh. sentence of the presentation Boston <laughs> Boston seriously considering the opt-in yeah, that's what's really great news. Fantastic. Um, so I guess we can leave the the slides up in case there's any questions. Um, if there are questions, please put them in, and we'll try. We'll we'll circle back around. Um, uh, and one, why don't we start a little bit with the logic? Well, you know, what is mandated passive house? What does that mean? Uh, we have a question around that, and I guess Mike question is where you know you described that mandating uh, multifamily large multifamily I would say it where the the jurisdictions have adopted this opt-in code um and why do you see multifamily as the sweet spot in some way to get to get the ball rolling with that sort of to and and the logic for having passive house as a as a compliance pathway with that yeah that's a good question. So let's unpack that. The, the reason that we that we uh, put residential multifamily in in the passive house must be mandatory bucket, as opposed to like you know office buildings and everything else, is just the the tremendous track record of passive house is so well proven. Um, so we felt like that was that shouldn't be a reach. Um, I, I don't mean to undermine that. It's, it, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, you know, a big departure from the way people have been building buildings. Um, but it is, we, we would say that it's a proven reach. Right. Um, and so it made sense to us that it, that the specialized opt-in should um, land there. Um, the other element in this is that Mass Save has been um, providing a rebate, three thousand dollars per unit, for about four years now for passive house. Um, we've had one passive house in Massachusetts. That's one O N E one um, five or six years ago, and now we have something like twelve thousand or fifteen thousand passive house units that are built or in construction yeah. um, in, in Massachusetts. So looking at that take uptake coupled with the rebate of 3000 per unit, um, again, that, that just sort of kept reinforcing that this is a reach, but it's a realistic reach for the cities and towns that, that want to achieve that, um, so that, that, and then I, maybe just a little bit more about implementation of this. Um, so where it's mandatory is where the cities and towns choose to go that extra level of specialized opt-in, which is the third level. That's the dark blue here. Uh, so that's literally just become an option in the last couple of months. Um, by this time next year, hopefully we'll see <laughs> many dozens of cities and towns that have opted for this. And then in terms of rollout, um, let me just go to this guy here. Um, um, it becomes mandatory in January 2023 for five stories or less, any building over any residential building over 12,000 square feet. And then in January 2024, it's um, uh, for all residential, no matter how tall. Um, so that's just the way that, that we decided to roll it out. Right. From the time that they adopt the regulation, and then it's a year out, or Absolutely. the January twenty twenty three is in like Boston adopts it. It's not going backwards, right? It's going. Yes. Yeah, so if if someone um, adopts the so right now, if someone was um, in the. Um, uh, yeah, so that is confusing. I'm sorry. It, it, <laughs> I, 
I just want to clarify, it's going forward. You're not, because that actually so, was something that happened with the stretch code, I think when it was passed before projects got stuck in the middle somehow. And Yeah, yeah, all right. So I should just, I should fix this um, illustration. <laughs> so that bullet should just say, it's already required for, uh, so, it, so the moment you adopt the uh, specialized, passive house is mandatory for uh, five stories or less, 12, over 12,000 square feet. And then a year out from now, it becomes mandatory for all. Um, so that's just how it works. So now, if a, if a town opts in for the specialized code, you know, like three years from now, the moment they adopt it, there's no waiting time for them. Like they would be mandatory passive house for all buildings um, from that moment on. Yeah. Right. And so the mandatory passive house is for the multifamily above 12,000 square feet that goes to five stories and then above five stories um, phased in. Uh, but that's the limit of the mandate for passive house. But where it is mandated, you can't do the Teddy, you can't do hers, you can't do another compliance path, um, right? Yes. It's really, it is truly mandated. It's truly mandated. There's no other options. Right. It's mandatory um, for and, those and both. And just to be clear for everybody, both the FIAS and the PHI standards are available for that, as well as the WUFI passive model for PH for FIAS and the PHPP for passive house. Uh, That's correct. PHI. Yeah, both yeah. both pathways are available. The details of you know when you have to be certified, and that's all written in the code. We have uh, you know if you're if you're interacting with PHI, it's these rules in terms of what you have to be what by when. If you're interacting with FIAS, it's the, you know it's those rules. So they have different, slightly different process. So either right. one works. Um, and uh, and then there and and we we made no there, there's no other code changes to what PHI or FIAS requires. It's simply as is. Um, the only thing that is uh, in addition to PHI or FIAS is the is mandatory EV readiness. Right. And and PV readiness to some extent. So so that really not, not much to do with the building itself. Um, right. And and as well where there are mixed use buildings, the PH uh, the, the passive house certification is applying to the residential portion of the building. Um, mm -hmm. And you would have the, presumably the Teddy applying to the others or? That's correct. Yeah. So for example, if you had a building that was, you know, the first few levels was office and then the top 10 levels was, was residential and you were in a uh, specialized opt-in town um, after these dates, um, the residential would be mandatory passive house, and then the office would be mandatory Teddy. Mm -hmm. um, and and I just, just to reinforce this point again, like think of like Venn circles here. Um, the the passive house is mandatory for the for the residential type uses, but all the other building uses, with just a few exceptions, mandatory to be the Teddy, which similarly. Um, uses a strategy of envelope improvements, energy recovery. You have to do those things to achieve those teddies. Right. Um, so it's passive house type of right. approaches for all buildings. Right. You've applied the logic across the board. We've applied uh, the logic across the board. Yes. I mean, that's what's really incredible is, uh, you know, it's been so frustrating over these last years. What You know, when you get involved in passive house and really low energy building, and you have these conversations where the basic uh, understanding of the building science and the implications of it and the grid and what we're looking about re with renewables are kind of known by all, uh, but it, there's kind of an inertia to the conversation where you kind of revert to habit because it just seems too shocking to step out of what we've always done in a way. And here yeah. you've managed to break through <clears throat> inertia somehow and um i'm really wondering so you you are really driving this with ian uh finley son and um and others maybe could i mean i think what you were speaking to for a moment about the utilities and their position on this and one issue i wanted to throw into as well where you were talking about the heat crushing the heat demand cooling may go up so what it's only a little bit but this idea of um you know, we have a real seasonal issue, right? Where all the renewables are 
or much of the renewables are in the summer cooling season, much less available in the winter in the heating season and what the utilities are are planning or or their position regarding seasonal seasonal storage um and the yeah there's, there's a lot of dynamics to that so um you know a, a big part of the renewable inputs by 2050 is offshore wind ah. so so that has that doesn't have so much a seasonal um up and down that's just steady 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 it, it has a daily up and down so it tends to be way more productive at night and then during the day it, it slows down a bit with less wind um so and then the obviously the solar is is more of an input through the summer but that makes up a, a, a smaller part of our um of our inputs but yeah uh storage is a big issue and that that is the one thing that we have to do with our grid so that way we can and, and typically it's it's a it's a it's a few hour type of storage as opposed to a seasonal type of storage um you know so that way we can make sure that the solar inputs go into the grid when it's helpful to do so um so that that has to happen kind of under all circumstances regardless of what building dynamics do because of the nature of needing to shift those solar inputs to later in the day um so yeah, it's it's a really fascinating, cool discussion. Um, but back to like back to your point about um, stepping out of the box. The, I think the thing that really sealed the deal for going this direction was to show the carbon footprint of buildings with and without gas, with and without the better you know energy energy efficiency in twenty fifty. And you know to show to show leadership that you know if if you build with gas today you're going to have this legacy, and and in in thirty years you know three quarters of the carbon footprint of that building is going to just be attributed to just space heating from the gas that was put in thirty years ago, and that that I think is really um, it made it very clear that the direction here is um, is really there's just only one choice. Yeah. So on that note, um, a follow up and, and maybe this gets a little, well, it's not inside baseball, but I was listening to the Pass House Massachusetts uh, presentation the other day um, where they're talking about the progress of the implementation of the opt in code and noting, you know, a couple of the towns were going for the gas ban, but not necessarily the opt in portion. Um, and I'm just wondering if what they didn't go into that in detail but um what are not that i could tell the what's your sense of that how people are are evaluating this so in massachusetts the gas ban is another part of 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 the town's options right yeah let me let me just provide a little bit more background about that so um in mass all cities and towns can opt into the stretch spe specialized and many already have almost all of them. And then all cities and towns can opt in to, so let me, I said the wrong words. Um, all cities and towns can opt into the stretch code, which gives you the teddies and that stuff, which is great. And then all cities and towns can opt into the specialized, which gives you the passive house mandatory and more electrification and PV. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And the other thing is we have another separate um, legislative um, uh, driven um, thing that's come along, which will allow 10 cities and towns to uh, opt in to have a gas ban. So it's limited to just 10. I'm, the I'm first sure. 10. <laughs> first 10 that sign up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not statewide. So that that's kind of on the side of all this energy efficiency thing. Um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, just, did they limit it to the 10 because they are not mandating, you know, energy, you know, super low energy and, and they're worried about the grid or? I don't know. I, yeah. I honestly don't know the, the story behind why it's just 10 and not 20 or not all. Um, so right. I think maybe just to be an experiment. Um, but I, you know, I, to be honest with you, I, I don't. With, with with the way that our stretch code is written, where we crush the heating demand to oblivion, um, I, I, I'm actually not that worried about 
whether there needs to be a gas ban or not and that kind of thing. Because at the end of the day, we end up with these buildings that have, that it doesn't make sense to actually put gas in them. No. Because the, because the heating's so small. Um, and if you did, it's just not a big deal because the heating's so small. Right. So to us, the priority always was less of this sort of myopic focus about myopic focus about gas bans, not gas bans, getting in that debate seemed unnecessary if you can solve the underlying problem of heat, of, of heat demand, which right. we can. And all because of you know the success of passive house. Um, and, and and just to you know all all the passive house folks out there that you know you, you all have been doing this for decades and and I, you know we just want to thank you because the the fact that passive house has so quickly adopted really um, it, it really made it easy for us to to achieve this because it was very simple to explain that this is already happening everywhere. And you can do passive house for all building types. And what we're doing with our Teddy is just kind of a simpler version of that. So it's it's all feasible. So yeah. if passive house hadn't sort of exploded in the last five years, there was no way we could have gotten this across the finish line. Right. Yeah, great point. And um, we we must acknowledge that passive house stands on the shoulders of generations of of work and lots of different inputs and and um and development over the years it mm -hmm. has though i mean i think passive house for a lot of people crystallizes the issue right it's like you're looking at a kaleidoscope of levers and i think those energy models where you're looking at and you know energy use intensity generally is you know is blinding in terms of of you know finding the path and and passive house really helped define that path I think this presentation that you gave is another, you've taken it to another level of, of you know, clarifying the issues uh, and seeing Passive House as a tool um, to, uh, to drive that. One thing that is surprising when looking at the code adoption with the stretch and uh, the opt-in that jumps out is the elimination of ASHRAE as a compliance pathway um, going forward. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about that. I mean, it obviously lays into your logic, but to actually see it be eliminated is another thing like, oh, you know, what are the, what, what are you hearing about that? So in the, in our code right now, we didn't totally eliminate the ASHRAE percent better type of thing. Um, that's still a pathway for particular building types that use very high ventilation like hospitals. So we still have that in our code. Um, we, I worked and we all worked very hard to see if we could actually completely eliminate it um, because we didn't want any sort of loopholes. Um, but it turned out to be uh, just too high of a hill to climb. So we, we, we decided to uh, kind of pick our battles here and um, eliminate the percent better ASHRAE approach for the most common building types. Right. Um, okay. So yeah. that's what I saw from the previous presentation was you're speaking to the most common. Yeah. Common yeah. So, types. so office have to do this, um, residential schools, you know, all, all these very common building types that make up most of our, most of our new construction in the next 30 years. Um, and any pushback on that or just from vested interests or is it pretty much the static and, and full speed ahead? We have a lot of pushback on it, um, and uh, a lot of the modeling community is um, is struggling with um, with you know why there needs to be a switch from an EUI to basically a Teddy, mm -hmm. um, and and it, it's 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 kind of uncanny because the the modeling community that's familiar with Passive House they to like i think it's just been in their dna like that makes sense because now i can use a teddy model to you know make sure my windows make sense make sure my external shading makes sense um like eui sort of oriented models has just never been part of their toolbox to right. to, to go to you know to consider those kind of things so so i think it's going to be a bit of a culture shift um switching from 
you know, in DUI type of modeling as being basically almost universal to um, to a to a Chetty type model. Right. I, and one one uh, final note here, and I want to acknowledge there are a lot of questions in the chat that we're not going to get to, but what I'd like to do is pass them on to you, Paul. And I know you're super busy, but maybe we can um, get some answers to some and we'll post them with the recorded video online uh, in the next week. And so people will be able to refer to this. I'm sure this is going to be a, a very popular video. Um, I did want to just make one note though, which I thought it, it jumped out at me, you know, in dealing with the cooling and hitting on it again, passive house people get it, but I think it can't be said enough is like dealing with overheating, the cooling is not necessarily an uh, insulation air tightness issue, which drives comfort in many ways, but it is, uh, it is something we need to minimize and mm -hmm. that, and that and that external shading, deeper windows, these uh, landscaping, other things, um, some of which you showed there, uh, to be taken up in earnest and not be an afterthought. Um, Absolutely, is another yeah. huge shift in building culture. You know, um, which is you know is is very lacking. Yeah, and I I didn't appreciate it myself until we learned about you know five six eight years ago when we learned about passive house in earnest, and to to us it was just like aha moment after one after the other, and you know as you said the people that that have developed this over the decades previously have really laid the groundwork and you know so we learned from them and are hopefully applying those uh, those that wisdom to the larger code. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, thank you so much, Paul. This was an excellent presentation and I really enjoyed the discussion. I thank everyone for being here um, and joining us and we look forward to hearing more going forward. Um, I look forward to being in Boston next week and uh, hearing from all kinds of people about what's happening. Uh, again, just so everybody's clear, this is both for PHI certification and FIA certification, uh, both energy models. I guess the last question is, once you do the PHPP and the or the Woofy Passive, you don't need to do another energy model, right? Yeah, um, if, you're, if you're using the Passive Health pa Path, yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So there's no more, there's always a worry about duplicating energy models. This is streamlining that process. Yeah. Another, another solid step forward. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ken. We really appreciate the invitation and thank you all for, uh, for participating and, and joining and appreciate the interest. Absolutely. And we'll uh, follow up with these questions here. Thank you, everybody. Right. Yeah. Have, Have a great, great day, day everyone. Bye-bye.